Hi, everyone. My name is Ana Sangronis, and I'm the Florida Sea Grant Extension Agent in Miami-Dade County. I'm excited to join you for virtual camp. Today, I'm going to be taking you on a tour of mangroves, and we'll be discussing the biology and ecology of these trees. The majority of the tour will take place in Crandon Park, which is on Key Biscayne, just outside of downtown Miami. We're also going to briefly visit Peacock Park, Hobie Beach, and Chapman Field Park. I hope that you enjoy this tour, and perhaps we can do one in person together soon. Let's get started. What is a mangrove? The term mangrove expresses two distinct concepts. The first use of the term encompasses the entire plant community, including individual mangrove species. This is often referred to as a mangrove forest, ecosystem, swamp, community, etc. The second term refers to the species of trees that grow in saline soils. In this sense, the term mangrove is a catch-all. It's a botanically diverse, non-taxonomic expression given to approximately 12 families and more than 50 species of tropical trees and shrubs. Mangroves are trees that live in the calm intertidal areas where temperatures generally do not drop below freezing for extended periods of time. They are circumglobal with the majority of populations found between the latitudes of 30 degrees north and south. The determining factors for location of mangroves are warm currents. Here in Florida, mangroves generally exist south of St. Augustine on the east coast and south of Cedar Key on the west coast. The largest populations of mangroves are in the 10,000 Islands area and Florida Bay. All in all, there are about 500,000 acres of mangroves in Florida. These trees and shrubs reside in the intertidal areas or boundary zone on the edge of land and sea. While they're found in the tropics and subtropics, their distribution is dependent upon four major factors including climate, salt water, tidal fluctuation, and type of soil. The mangrove's tidal environment is harsh with anaerobic sediments or no oxygen, fluctuating water levels, and high salt content. Mangroves favor these conditions not because they can't live in fresh water, but because fewer species are able to live in this environment, so there's less ecological competition. Unlike their freshwater counterparts, mangroves thrive in this habitat because of evolved adaptations in their root structure, reproductive strategies, and the ability to maintain a salt balance. Surprisingly, individual species have evolved different solutions to deal with the same challenges. Here in Florida, we have three true mangrove species. Can anyone guess as to what these are? We have the red, the black, and the white. I wanna throw up a little pop quiz for you guys, just to guess and see where your knowledge of mangroves is at. And just to think, what type of mangrove is this? Is it a white, a red, a black, or a buttonwood? This is a painting that was done by my brother the first time he ever saw a mangrove, just earlier this year. And he loved it so much that he created this painting for me, which now hangs in my office. To identify mangroves, we'll use a different variety of techniques. We'll be looking at the morphology of the roots and also comparing the leaves. Something really important to note here is that the leaves of true mangroves are opposite one another, whereas associated species like the buttonwood have leaves that alternate. This can assist with proper identification. The red mangrove or Rosophorum, Rosophorum mango can grow to about 60 to 65 feet tall. These mangroves have their best growth in areas with good flushing generally found lower than the mean high water line. 
This means that red mangroves can grow further out into the water than the other mangroves and are usually flooded at high tide. They can root on intertidal surfaces like oyster beds and sandbars forming little mangrove islands. Red mangroves are easily identified by their tall arching roots, called prop or aerial roots, that give them the appearance of walking on water, a little bit like stilts. These roots are adapted to supply air to the underground roots by way of their pores called lenticels. These roots also add to the stability of the trees. Next up is the black mangrove or Avicennia germinans. Thinking back to that painting just a couple minutes ago that you saw, the black mangroves, that's what that was. And these grow closer to the shore where they're only reached by high tides. At their northern edge of their range, which is St. Augustine on the east coast of Florida and Cedar Key on the Gulf Coast, the trees are small and shrub-like. Larger trees up to 50 feet tall with a branch spread of 35 feet are found further south around Sanibel and Captiva Islands. Their main feature is these peg roots, which are called nematophores, and these work like a snorkel. They provide oxygen to the submerged set of cable roots that are under the water's surface. The other identifying feature is their leaves, and their leaves are a little pointier and less thick than the red mangrove leaves, and they have a silverish gray color to them. And a little clue that you can use is black, black salt on back. What this means is that red man, excuse me, black mangroves excrete salt through their leaves. And so when you see that silverish gray coating, that's actually salt coming out of their leaves and that's how the black mangrove is able to deal with the salt. And you can actually lick the salt and taste it to confirm. The last of our true mangroves is the white mangrove or Lagocularia racemosa. Even though these are really salt tolerant, white mangroves typically grow at the highest and driest part of the tidal zone. They may have peg or prop roots, and that depends on their habitat conditions, but most of them have neither. They are best differentiated from other mangroves by these paddle-shaped, succulent, light green leaves that are rounded at the base and tip and smooth underneath. At the base of each leaf gland, excuse me, at the base of each leaf are glands called nectaries, which excrete sugar and salt. These allow salt to pass through the leaves. Glands on the leaf stalks and leaf blade are conspicuous and distinctive in shape and position. And the last clue with respect to the leaves is this little notch at the top of each leaf that makes it a dead giveaway for the white mangrove. Here in Florida, we have one important mangrove associate, the buttonwood. There are two species, the silver buttonwood and the green buttonwood. And it's not a true mangrove in that there's no tendency for root modification or vivipary, which is the reproductive strategy that I'll be talking about in just a moment but it's a really important tree in the transition zone on the upland edge of the mangrove forest. And here in this picture, you can take note of the very sharply pointed alternating leaves. And you find this a lot. They are pretty tolerant of salt and the harsh conditions. So you'll find them in coastal areas and they're also used frequently in landscaping. New mangrove trees establish themselves further away from the original trees by a well-adapted reproductive process. This is called vivipary. And in vivipary, the seeds sprout into seedlings called propagules while they are still attached to the parent tree. The sprouts then drop to the ground or into the water. When a seedling lands in the water, it may either take root among other mangrove roots or float with the current until it drifts onto suitable ground. Seedlings remain viable for long periods of time and can become established after floating as long as 12 months. The propagules are another way to distinguish between the species. Each mangrove species typically grows in a specific zone along the shoreline. 
The existence of distinct zones, each dominated by a different mangrove species, is often evident in well-developed mangrove swamps or communities. Usually red mangroves grow closest to the water, black mangroves grow a little further upland than the reds, and whites grow the most landward. This is a photo, a perfect example where mother nature breaks the rules. This is a mangrove growing right in Biscayne Bay off of Chapman Field Park, lower Pinecrest area. And at a quick glance, looking to see, you can tell that it's completely submerged. There's no, at least from this picture, there's no coastline immediately associated with it. This is a black mangrove living in the middle of the bay. So a propagule made it here, found suitable ground, established itself and sprouted up in the middle of the water, which is usually more typical of the red mangroves. Now, almost all life on Earth relies directly or indirectly on primary production. In other words, the synthesis of organic compounds through photosynthesis. Mangroves are considered primary producers or autotrophs, the organisms responsible for primary production, which form the base of the food chain. Mangroves are highly productive ecosystems with an average above ground net primary production very similar to terrestrial tropical rainforests. Such average numbers mask enormous spatial variation. An actual mangrove primary productivity is determined by a range of factors, including climate, freshwater input, and nutrient availability. Mangrove forest, forests produce 3.6 tons per acre of leaf litter per year. This decomposed detritus forms the foundation of the mangrove food web. The branches and root system of the mangroves provide protected nursery areas for shellfish, crustaceans, and fish. A host of primary consumers, ranging in size from insects to even deer and cattle, feed directly on the trees. Macroalgae and photosynthetic microorganisms growing on roots, fallen tree parts, and the sediment surface also contribute to primary productivity in mangrove systems. The highest levels of productivity is along creek banks and forest edges. Local mangroves are highly productive in small demersal fish and invertebrates that during relatively low water periods become highly concentrated and exploited by water bird species and game fish. These wetlands also provide critical nesting habitat for water birds and nursery habitat for fishery species. Mangrove forests provide primary habitat and predation refuge for thousands of species at all levels of marine and forest food webs, from bacteria to goliath groupers and herons. A number of spatial guilds for mangrove associated species have been identified. Guilds are groups of species that utilize the same resources. In this case, they share the same location. The sublittoral and littoral guild uses the prop root zone of red mangroves because they provide sessile filter feeding organisms such as bryozoans, tunicates, barnacles, oysters, and mussels with an ideal environment. Mobile organisms such as crabs, shrimp, snails, boring crustaceans, polychaete worms, and many species of juvenile fish and other transient species also utilize the prop root zone of mangroves as both a predation refuge and feeding area. Mangroves shelter insects that take cover in the dense branches, attracting birds that feed on them. These coastal forests are prime nesting and resting sites for hundreds of shorebirds and migratory bird species, including kingfishers, herons, and egrets. The soft, nutrient-rich soil beneath mangrove roots provides habitat for burrowing species such as snails and clams. But wait, there's more. Mangroves help improve water quality too. They do this by extracting excess nutrients and by facilitating the detoxification and storage of pollutants in the sediments. Mangroves can also filter and remove runoff, debris, and pollutants from the adjacent uplands. This prevents the pollutants from contaminating waters and helps to maintain and improve water quality, as well as protecting the offshore seagrass and coral reef communities. 
Here in Southeast Florida, it is important to point out that mangroves are part of an interconnected ecosystem. Their productivity and health are closely linked to nearby coastal habitats, including estuarine areas where fresh and saltwater meet, seagrass beds, nearshore hard bottom, and the coral reefs that line our coast. They also provide food for a number of marine species, including oysters, shrimp, snook, snapper, tarpon, jack, sheep's head, and red drum. Mangroves are sources for the export of organic material into coastal waters. In addition, they enhance the fish biomass on the nearby seagrass beds and corals, and other reef-building invertebrates have been found to assimilate near mangrove organic material. More specifically, 90% of game fish and 75% of commercial fish species rely on mangroves during some part of their life. When we think about ecological function, mangroves provide tr tremendous amounts of ecosystem services. And we think about here in Southeast Florida, our first natural line of defense against major storm action are coral reefs. But one of the next ones in line are mangroves. And mangroves reduce 66% of wave height, helping to minimize erosion as well as flood risk. This is also really important because as we think about moving forward and creating resilient coastlines, especially in the face of rising seas and climate change, this makes mangroves a really strong component of living shorelines. When we think about what they do, the habitat they provide, and the stability they provide. A study published this year by Dantes et al looked at the Tampa Bay area and compared created salt marshes and established mangrove forests. And the study confirmed that the greater the age of the system, the higher the carbon storage potential. And this was important because mangroves, as saltwater levels increase and saltwater intrudes inward, mangroves will encroach and eventually displace salt marsh. But the interesting thing is that the greenhouse gas sequestration by the year 2100 in this area is expected to increase by about 2.1 million tons, which is really interesting. Now, it's true that mangroves can be naturally damaged and destroyed, but there's no doubt that human impact has been the most severe. Mangrove and upland habitats in South Florida have been destroyed mostly due to urbanization and have also resulted in altered shoreline and circulation patterns. These impacts to mangrove forests can be direct, where the forest and plants are immediately affected, or indirect, where the forest species composition and functions are modified over time. Some natural threats include tropical storms, pests and parasites, excessive flooding, which can be exacerbated by sea level rise, nutrient imbalance, and invasive species. Anthropogenic or man-made threats include urbanization and development, pollution and water quality, deforestation for agriculture, use of wood for timber and charcoal, and unfortunately use as dumping grounds. I have another little pop quiz for you guys. Just tell me what you think. What percentage of mangroves have been lost in Florida since the 1940s, which is around when heavy development really began? Is it 27%, 54%, 86%, or 92%? When you think about it, here in Florida, mangrove shorelines have historically been a prime target for waterfront residential property development activities. Mangrove trees have been removed and the sites filled and leveled to build roads, waterfront homes, and businesses. Direct loss of mangrove habitat by conversion to agricultural or urban lands, clear cutting for timber, fuel wood, charcoal, impounding for mosquito control, and conversions to salt ponds for fish and shellfish culture operations have resulted in loss of over half the area occupied by mangroves around the world. 
In Florida, mangroves are being displaced rapidly by invasive plants, particularly Brazilian pepper and Australian pine. Now we're going to answer that quiz question. The Florida Marine Research Institute estimates an 86% loss in the state's mangroves since the 1940s. Welcome to Miami. I wanted to include a few historical photographs so that you guys could really get a good sense visually for how much this area has changed in the last hundred years. Major development of the area began in 1905 with the construction of an artificial inlet called Government Cut and the associated Miami Chip sh Ship Channel. Peak development occurred in the 1920s with causeway constructions and another artificial inlet, Baker's Hallover, in 1925. More than 50% of the North Biscayne Bay bottom communities, including seagrass habitats, were dredged to provide fill for the development of man-made islands and surrounding wetlands. Low coastal wetlands and fringing mangroves were virtually eliminated and replaced with bulkhead, bulkheads and fill. Now, about half of the existing North Biscayne Bay bottom area is barren. Nothing's growing there. Pictured here are aerial views of Dinner Key Marina in Coconut Grove and aerial views of the Miami River. So it really paints this dramatic picture of just how much development has changed our coastline, displacing all of these native plants and fauna, including mangroves. And as a result of all of this development, all of the change and loss to habitats, the Mangrove Trimming and Preservation Act was created. This was originally enacted in 1991 and then altered in 1996, and it essentially established major penalties associated with altering mangroves. The Mangrove Trimming and Preservation Act is administered by the Florida Department of Environmental Protection, and Miami-Dade County also has the authority to administer the act. And what this act has done is essentially made the mangrove the most protected tree in the state of Florida. And what that really means is that if someone is proposing a project that involves either the removal of mangroves or the trimming of mangroves, not only is it a regulated activity, meaning you have to get a permit and pay fees for the permit, there are also fines in place if any of the work is done improperly or illegally. And so that's meant to help preserve and conserve the mangrove trees and also deter people from perhaps taking on projects that might otherwise remove the trees. As such, the Mangrove Trimming and Preservation Act is probably the most important tool in the toolbox when it comes to policy to protect this very critical habitat that does all sorts of incredible things, not just for the environment, but also for us. And so the next time you're out driving around a coastal area, I challenge you to not only try to identify what kind of mangroves you might be seeing, but also hopefully look at them in a new light and think about all that they contribute to our lives in Florida. Even if you don't live right on the coast, even if you live further inland, or even if you live elsewhere in the state, not near the coast at all, think about the habitat that the mangroves provide for potential fish species that maybe you like to fish for or eat. And think about how the mangroves might help protect your loved one's homes in the face of big storms. I thank you all for hanging with me. And once again, this is Ana Sangronis, Florida Sea Grant Extension Agent, Miami-Dade County, UFIFIS Extension. I hope to work with you all again soon.